Ann Armstrong. Come on up. Hi, my name is Ann Armstrong. I'm one of the founders of the Auditory Society, and the Auditory Society is a group of people that just appreciate odd, freaky trees. Um, I'm not a tree expert. I don't have any formal education in trees. I'm just a tree aficionado and a tree advocate. Um, so, I guess you might be wondering, what is an auto tree? An auto tree is a tree or a part of a tree that is exhibiting some unexpected tendencies that are an internal response to some external condition. This external condition could be a man-made condition, like infrastructure getting in its root zone and causing it to rise up, or it could be something natural, like a flood that it's been repeatedly exposed to. The origins of the Auditory Society lie in vandalism, architecture, and friendship. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a bit about the origins, then I'm gonna get into the underpinnings, and some frameworks for engaging with trees and increasing your, or lessening your tree blindness, I guess. And I'm gonna close with some examples of auto trees. And my goal with this talk would be to give you the lens to see auto trees and just sort of sensitize you to trees as individuals. Because uh, we, we're very aware of trees, we see them, we live amongst them, but I think uh, as some of my examples might show, or some of my personal experiences might show, we don't always see them as individuals with struggles, tendencies, and characteristics of their own. So vandalism. I went to UT, I got a Master's of Architecture degree, but after that I went and became a welder for 10 years, and I got, that was like an entry point into public art and sculpture. So I actually produced quite a bit of public art and sculpture and unfortunately, all of it was vandalized. <laughs> and that just comes with the territory. You put something out in public, it's gonna get knocked, graffitied, or cut apart. And that's kind of heartbreaking for me. Uh, and there's often not funding to fix these vandalized pieces of art. So the artist is often in a position to use their own resources to correct the problem. Um, so this started to plant the seed, like how can I inform public space and shape space and place, because I'm an architect and I care about those things, but how can I do it without putting something out there that can get damaged and hurt? <laughs> um, the second reason is architecture. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm an architect, studied architecture, loved looking at architecture for most of my life until suddenly, I don't know, the last 10 to 15 years in Austin, looking at architecture has kind of made me angry. It's become more profit-driven <laughs> and less human-centered, and it just makes me mad. So uh, I started to look at architecture less and be less curious about architecture and devote less attention to architecture and pay more attention to accidents that happen between buildings, how people use the space between buildings, and random, obscure things you find in the urban fabric and I started creating a pedestrian guide to odd things in central Austin called the Urban Oddities Guide. And the more I paid attention to these weird, freaky things that didn't have a capitalist agenda, the happier I got. <laughs> so, uh, and then the third thing, friendship. Um, I was finishing up the Urban Oddities Guide and uh, I had a chance encounter with Angela Hansen, who used to be the city of Austin's urban forester and we struck up a conversation. I was thinking, hmm, maybe she knows about some weird trees. And she did. And we became friends. And we created this concept of the Auditory Society. So um, the bulk of the work of the Auditory Society was the Auditory Guide, which is funded by an urban forestry grant. I have some up here at the end. If you need one, please come take one off my hands. Uh, one thing to note, this is a great labor of love to create this guide. You cannot go to the library and look up a book or a magazine on odd trees in Austin. You have to do the legwork to find them. So Angela helped sort of lay the ground with some initial sites. 
She eventually moved to Europe, so I finished this sort of on my own, sourcing locations and odd trees, filling in a calendar of tree events that you could witness throughout the year. There's also a lexicon of specific types of auto trees you can see anywhere, and some just general data and weird facts about trees. So this was sort of an exercise in world building, in a way. Um, and this is the foundation of the Auto Tree Society. It has our philosophy, and it's quite uh, extensive, if you ask me. So, um, so you, can, you can go through all this trouble and make this guide and put five years into it and give it away for free, but that doesn't mean anyone is gonna go look at these weird trees. They may, they may not. They may just like take this and put it on their shelf and never use it. Um, and that's, that's fine because it turns out I actually like to engage with people and trees together <laughs> in real time. My favorite thing about this is looking at trees with people and sharing the experience and hearing about their perceptions of trees, whether they're odd trees or normal trees or beautiful trees uh, of all kinds. So the ingredients that sort of make up the philosophy and the inner workings of the Auto Tree Society and a lot of my interpretive work in general are novelty, exploration, discovery, empathy, curiosity, embodiment, attention, mindfulness, and presence. And these are just kind of human qualities that we all have in us. And I think we feel better when we engage with them. So the Auto Trees Society and its projects and associated events tries to magnify those things or engage those things in, in between us and our interactions. So now I'm gonna talk about some frameworks for creating connection between people and trees and people in our environment. But before digging into those examples, I just want to read the poem from Mary Oliver. I guess it's an excerpt from Sometimes. It's pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. Uh, and that really resonates with me and these projects, particularly the tell about it. Because I think we take on information more permanently and more deeply when we process it through ourselves. So it's one thing to observe something, but it's an entirely different thing to sort of put your perception or your, your impression or dialogue about it outside yourself after observing it. So that processing, I think, is a really important part of these projects. So this is a project that was done uh, last week <laughs> as a part of Northern Southern Gallery's From Show. That's a semi-regular show where artists do art outside across the city. And you know I don't like to do sculptures because they're going to get trashed. So uh, this is a tree tour of the underpass at Tillery and 7th, which is a spectacular place. Uh, has anyone been to this overpass? Uh, I call it a tree sanctuary <laughs> because it literally feels like a church and it's surrounded by trees. So uh, this is just a guided, slightly guided exploration of that underpass, highlighting 10 trees and giving you a tactile or a sensory prompt at each tree. And you can go there tomorrow and go on this tour. It's self-guided or you can come by on Saturday morning where we're actually going to meet at 8 a.m. and do a group tour of this spot. This is another show that's currently on at the Stuffed Animal Rescue Foundation. Are you all familiar with the Stuffed Animal Rescue Foundation? Also known as the SARF. <laughs> um, that's, uh, I guess usually it pops up at the 37th Street lights, but they actually have a brick and mortar uh, storefront now on Hancock Drive. So uh, this is a collaboration with the SARF and the Auto Tree Society. It's called the Trunk Show. It's a little compact window display of tree-inspired art curated by a stuffy named Linnaeus. And this was sort of an experimentation with magical realism <laughs> uh, because we did an artist talk with Linnaeus and, the, uh, and Wendy who runs the SARF 
and we just sort of talked about Linnaeus's history, which ties back to the 1961 fish kill, which happened in Austin, which not many people know about, <laughs> and eventually factored into the Silent Spring, which led to the creation of the EPA. Uh, so trying to use stuffed animals to channel history that we sometimes forget about. Um, this is Boggy Mood. Is everyone, or are some of you aware of the really small museum? It's located in East Austin. There are two locations, and they're very small, and they're in two front yards. And uh, I collaborated with Christopher Kennedy to create a walk that connects the two and highlights the creek, which sort of runs between the two locations. Um, through the course of this process, we discovered a dissertation from UT from the 1990s that was all about Boggy Creek. And we were really excited because this person, Alice Boggs, had done all this research. And we thought, oh, this is a great way to bring this dissertation to life because it seems very obscure. I don't know who's reading it or what use it's had. Um, so we sort of sourced sites along the creek that engage the content of the dissertation and the actual space, uh, highlighting trees, man-made interventions, and some ecological history. And we led a guided walk with the neighborhood. And another one uh, from a couple years ago is called A Walk in the Park. It was done in collaboration with the Contemporary Austin, uh, located uh, based at their Laguna Gloria location, which is mostly a sculpture park. They wanted a way to engage the public during the pandemic. And knowing that the art is kind of static, how do you draw people to this place with new experiences? So we created four sort of sensory guides tied to the landscape with four local artists. So we ran workshops, captured the content from the workshops, and then created four separate excursions you could take around the property that sort of loosely guided you and let you come to your own conclusions around things like weeds, trees, acoustical ecology, and uh, natural pigments. And at the start of the pandemic, when we were all sort of really not even hanging out in parks, like people would get kicked out kicked out of tennis courts because the city felt, thought it was unsafe for people to interact in public <laughs> back in the day. Uh, so with tree folks, they had to cancel all their public programs. So they reached out and wanted to create a workshop that could be executed digitally that still engaged people with trees. So we created the overstory, understory workshop. And that sort of ran a week. It was two meetings. We gathered digitally talked about our sites, which were basically our own backyards. Each participant was asked to sort of find and sit with a tree in their own backyard and make observations over the course of a week, kind of pretending to be a tourist and creating a travel guide to their tree. So we reconvened the second week, and people shared their movies, their experiments, their illustrations, and it was sort of like virtual mental tourism to everyone else's backyard, which felt really nice when we were all trapped at home. We could at least mentally explore these other places. So here are a couple of the projects. Uh, stink, bug, stink bug eggs in a mesquite tree were actually really exciting to watch evolve over the course of a week. And these were some pigments someone had made from a tree in their yard. Um, and then the East Austin Studio Tour, we hosted a cherished wood show where we sourced wood objects and associated stories from the owners of the wood objects that sort of highlights how trees sort of permeate every aspect of our life, though we don't always think about it. Watercolor plant ID on Tillery Street at the same overpass that I referenced earlier. This was like a very powerful experience for me, and it was just IDing, water, uh, IDing specimens um, as a group. We'd go find our own specimen, bring it back, paint it, and then ID it. And this kind of goes back to that idea of processing. Like, 
looking, being astonished, telling about it, only in this case it's like painting. Um, the image on the left is a Anacacho orchid tree, and that <laughs> was a tree that someone else painted that I was really struck by. I was like, these leaves are amazing. They look like butterflies. And um, I just made a note of it, and I was like, oh, well, th that's a cool tree. I, I can't believe I've, I've never seen one before. Then I went home and parked, and I'd been parking next to one for two years, <laughs> but I had never seen it. It was tree blindness. Like, I had never looked at this tree, even though I had literally parked next to it for two years. So these moments where you can tune in and focus and uh, look a little closer kind of helps you see uh, things in more detail and intimacy. Last but not least, auto tree rides. Uh, every year we would do a group ride with the Giesalo Foundation, a uh, local bike advocacy, advocacy group, where we engage the guide, the printed guide, and we visit all the sites on bikes. And that's one of my favorite experiences, um, just because it's fun to ride bikes and look at trees. So, now, we're finally gonna look at some auto trees. Um, <laughs> thank you for listening to all that. I'm, try I'm gonna try to not talk too much about these auto trees. Um, does anyone know about horse chestnuts? <laughs> this is a horse chestnut. It's in Paris, and it has amazing bark patterns. This is an olive tree in Palma on Majorca. Olive trees have amazing growth patterns, especially the older they get. This olive tree is about 600 years old, so it's got lots of growths on it that are really spectacularly sculptural. This is another olive tree, also in Majorca, blown by the wind for its whole life. Uh, never had the chance to go, go straight up. This is, I believe, a fig in Mexico City. Uh, rough life, but it's still hanging on. These are uh, some spruce and pines in the Olympic National Forest, uh, covered in burls. Has anyone been to Goliad? Goliad, Texas. <laughs> uh, Goliad, Texas is amazing because they didn't cut down their live oaks when they paved the streets. They just left them. So there's seven or eight live oaks, giant live oaks in the middle of town, which are really, you don't see that every day. Uh, Roy Guerrero Park. This is a China berry tree, I think, that, you know, got planted under the overpass, grew up and had to fight for light, and now it's literally like hugging the overpass. This is near Sculpture Falls, just a cedar elm and a rock, engaged. <laughs> These are two American elms near Barking Springs. Uh, this is a phenomenon called anosculation, where two different trees kind of blend together and mesh. This is on Chacon Street, <laughs> just the giant post oak that has grown over the curb on the side of this house. Uh, this is from my neighborhood in East uh, MLK 183 area. A no dumping sign has been crushed by a cedar elm. Uh, this is a cypress knee on the Medina River. And there's nothing in here for scale, but this cypress knee is the biggest cypress knee I've ever seen. It's about three feet tall and really thick. And the thing about cypress knees, we don't really know why cypress trees have them. Uh, it may have to do with sort of structural support on riverbanks. It may have to do with trying to get extra oxygen. Uh, it's just one of those mysteries that hasn't been solved. And then the last few slides are just more cypress along the upper Guadalupe River, uh, which is flooded a lot <laughs> and really affected the shape of these trees and the condition of these trees, because sometimes they just get ripped out, 
Sometimes they're just hit with so much water, it morphs their shape into sort of inexplicable forms. Um, but they're all really beautiful, in my opinion. And this is our last slide. It's an amazing wave of a cypress trunk. Um, so thank you. Uh, I'm going to leave you. <laughs> I'm going to leave you with a few things. Uh, we have a tree playlist on Spotify. You can scan that QR code if you like it. It's a mix of different tree-themed songs. Um, if you need more auto trees in your life, we have a fairly active Instagram feed that is filled with hundreds of auto trees <laughs> across the globe, and we're constantly adding to it. And if you're in the mood for a real-time tree tour of the Tillery Street uh, Tree Sanctuary, that's this Saturday at 8 a.m. We're meeting at Flitch Coffee. That's it. All right, my dears. So do we have questions? I'm so glad to see some hands up. Also, just as a sidebar, do we have anybody, like, there was a, someone who wanted to make an announcement before the end of the show. Okay, great. Just make sure uh, when we get to the last question, rise up. Okay. So with that being said, I don't think I had picked anybody from the bar last time, so we'll start in this direction. What's your question? Can I have a pamphlet? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we can start these working around the room. Can, uh, the question is, can I have a pamphlet? The answer is, of course, yes. So uh, should we just pass around, or how do you want to do that? All right, do not feel like you're under any obligation. Jacob, do you want to do that? All right. Yeah, he thought I was just giving him a pamphlet. No, I'm making it work. All right. So that was an excellent kickoff question. Uh, what is our next question? How about over here? That uh, dissertation you mentioned, how do you uh, access that? How do you access the dissertation? There, there is a link to it online. Uh, I think if you go to the auditorysociety.org website under projects, you can find your way to Boggy Mood, which probably has a Google version of the tour, and there's a link to the thesis in there. But if you can't find it, uh, just let me know and I can dig it up. Boggs, A-C, Boggs. I, I, I might get the second initial wrong, but Boggs. And it's Boggy Creek, so perfect. Yeah. We have a question from Twitch, which we are delighted by, of course. And the question is, what was the name of that park again? Roy Guerrero Park? Or oh, uh, it's not a park. It's just an overpass. And it's uh, Tillery Street right under 7th. But it feels like a park to me. Excellent. All right, so now, let's go this way. I'm gonna widen out, here we go. I live in Hyde Park and the last winter storm was insane. We lost a lot of branches. Have you noticed any new sculptures, I guess, in a way? Has the winter storm resulted in any auto trees? Uh, yes, uh, the most prevalent thing you can see across the city is probably epicormic growth, and that's when like the branches kind of look hairy because they've developed, they've got all these sh new shoots of leaves on the branches as opposed to the branch tips. Um, I think that's the most common one, but sometimes you just see trees that have just completely been frozen on their outermost edges, and they just have green in the middle because that managed to resist the freeze more effectively. Um, so there's just a lot of you know, damaged looking trees, but some of them, like magnolia trees, no problem, no issues. Oaks, a lot of oaks have had damage. Palmettos, super frost resistant, but even the tips of their palms are yellow from the frost. So there's lots of subtle things that you can see all across the city that are definitely, they've permanently changed our, our canopy. All right, over here. Are there any auto trees you didn't have a picture of in Austin that you really, really enjoy? Any Austin auto trees that didn't make it into the slideshow? 
I'm really bad at archiving my photos. So yes, there's a lot that didn't make it in. One of my favorites is called um, Big Burley. He's in the guide. He lives in Palm Park. He's a Durand oak, and he is the burliest tree I've ever seen. Uh, it's probably at least 100 years old. It's been there a long time. And you can literally, and you shouldn't do this, but you can just climb right up the tree on the burls. They're so thick. Uh, so that's the first one that comes to mind. OK, how about you? Hold on. Uh, hi, uh, do you categorize like bench oaks? Um, are you familiar with bench oaks, like Native American bench oaks that basically there were signs of like sitting down and, you know, I was wondering if you happen to like chase that around Central Texas at all. Have you noticed any bench trees around here? I, I, I think I call them marker trees. Is that what you're talking about? Um, I have a book about marker trees that I have not fully dug into. I follow a lot of Facebook feeds, uh, like Texas Native Flora, and sometimes people will really get into it around the marker trees, because people get excited about it, and then other people are like, how could that possibly be a marker tree? Like, it's very hard to document whether or not it's legitimate, but you do see a lot of trees around town with horizontal branches, and it definitely makes you think, could it be a marker tree? Um, but it's hard to... The, the book I have is about marker trees around Dallas. I don't know if we have one about marker trees in Austin, but they definitely do exist in, in some shape or form around here. All right. Do we have any other questions? All right, excellent. I was just going to ask, do you have a favorite tree, whether that be a species of tree or a specific tree, and where do you find it? favorite tree? I am all about the bald cypress trees, <laughs> and they're quite pervasive along creeks and rivers here in Austin and Texas as a whole. Um, my favorite places to experience them are on the upper Guadalupe and the Medina River. The Medina River in particular, it is like a cathedral of bald cypress trees. It's just like you're constantly ensconced in these bald cypress along the, the whole stretch of this river, and it's really almost architectural, like a nave of a church. Um. I want to see this. It sounds amazing. All right, do we have a final question? No pressure. Where, where are we pointing? Oh, okay, sorry. Overshot a little bit. I'm curious what you think about, um, like, human interaction with trees and like architecturally or artistically, like specifically like either tree houses or repurposing trees that have died into totem poles or anything like that. Um, just general impressions. Humans doing stuff to trees, what do we think? <laughs> uh, as an architect, I'm very conflicted about trees <laughs> in general because construction and architecture obviously affect the urban forest and forests in general because we're manipulating sites, cutting down trees, using resources to get more lumber. Um, so in general, I feel awesome about salvage timber, which there's a lot of, especially after these storms, we lose a lot of trees. Um, harvest Lumber, which is right uh, next to the Tillery Street overpass that we are sort of looked at some slides about, has a great urban timber program. Um, I, I, I mean, I love wood. I love living next to wood. But every time I buy wood, uh, I built I built a house once, and I she it's a very it was a very small house. It was a 150 square foot tiny house and I sheathed it in cypress. But that was before I was obsessed with bald cypress trees. So I have some guilt about that because I'd rather have seen a cypress than this paneling in my house. So uh, conflicted. Tree houses that weigh down a tree or engage a tree are also maybe painful for me to look at, but I love being in them. So mixed emotions. <laughs>
Well, that's kind of the human condition, and it's probably a pretty good note to end on. So thank you so much. This was fantastic.